After taking the captured and carbonite frozen Han Solo from Cloud City Bespin, Boba Fett was forced to stop off on Nar Shaddaa to meet up with an old doctor friend of his because the carbonite began melting, potentially about to set Solo free. Unfortunately, as you can imagine from the very shady world of Nar Shaddaa, Han Solo's body was stolen from Boba, but not just by anyone. It was stolen by the henchman of the new leader of the Crimson Dawn crime syndicate, Kira. Kira and the Crimson Dawn had been off the galaxy's radar for years at this point and wanted to get their names back on the big stage with a massive heist. As a result, they invited all of the galaxy's big names from the Empire, the Rebel Alliance, the Crime World and more to witness the capture of Han Solo. So let's find out how Luke Skywalker gets his invitation. Also, make sure you're subscribed for every single part of the War of the Bounty Hunters event, as Lucasfilm have just confirmed that this series will be tied directly into the Book of Boba Fett TV show on Disney+. So the story begins with Luke Skywalker training on board a rebel ship in deep space, allowing the force to flow deeply through him. Luke ducks, weaves, flips and dodges, practicing his technique with his new yellow lightsaber, which he acquired after losing his fathers on Bespin. If you want to know how he got this yellow saber, let me know in the comments. As Luke is training, he embraces Master Yoda's words from Dagobah and successfully dismantles a couple of his training droids until he is interrupted by R2 and C-3PO. Luke casually deflects more blaster bolts as 3PO interrupts again and is very sorry for doing so. Luke doesn't mind, however, as he knows that a Jedi should be able to stay focused through much bigger distractions than someone saying hello there. After saying this, 3PO explains to his master that R2 has a message about the planet El Frona, the place where he found his lightsaber. Before they can get any further, Chewie comes storming through the hall and roars at Luke, much to his delight. The two are excited to see each other again, exchanging quick hellos, before Chewie delivers the real message. According to Chewbacca, there have apparently been sightings of the notorious and feared bounty hunter Boba Fett on the smuggler's moon, Nar Shaddaa, and because Chewie knows Boba has Han in his possession after Bespin, he wants Luke to help him travel there. Without even a glimpse of hesitation, Luke agrees to help Chewie out, and even suggests that they bring Lando along, because a guy like that is sure to know Nar Shaddaa like the back of his hand. Chewie, however, coming fresh off the Bespin incident, is not happy with that idea at all. Following this, the crew arrive above Nar Shaddaa, and Luke tells Chewie that he really hopes they can bring back some good news to Leia when they get back. Unfortunately, she's currently too busy planning Operation Starlight, which is the Rebels' plan of action to regroup after the Battle of Hoth. Following this, Luke and Chewbacca bring the Falcon down to land on the surface of the Smuggler's Moon, and Chewie is immediately greeted by his very old friend Sagwa, who was tragically enslaved on the spice mines of Kessel until Chewie freed him. And if you have a very keen eye, you may have noticed that Sagwa is actually one of the Wookiees that Chewie rescues in Solo A Star Wars Story after Lando's droid starts an uprising. Really cool that we're getting yet another connection to Solo in the War of the Bounty Hunter comics. 3PO then explains to Luke that as soon as Han was taken by Boba Fett on Bespin, Chewbacca immediately spread the word among the galaxy's free Wookiees, telling them to keep an eye out for Boba. Luckily for him, Sagwa happened to catch Boba on Nar Shaddaa. The two Wookiees then continue their conversation in their native language, while C-3PO translates to Luke, explaining that a new champion of the arena was recently crowned, and he managed to defeat the feared Worm and Lictor. Luke asks if this feared fighter was Boba Fett, and he is immediately told that it was someone named Django. Luke then says, Django, huh? Wrong name, but it sure looks like him. He immediately knows that this is probably Boba Fett, but is very puzzled as to why he's using the name Django, obviously not realizing the full history behind him. After this, the group travel to the Ticketmaster of the arena, who was here when Boba signed up, and Luke is forced to muzzle 3PO before handing over some credits to get some information on who beat Worm and Lictor. He then asks if it was a man named Boba Fett, but is met with a refusal because the fighters don't use their real names. Following this, the Ticketmaster pulls a low move and immediately betrays Luke, calling over the Kanji crime gang, the same ones who threatened Boba when he won, but this time they want Luke. The Kanji believe that Luke is a friend of the fighter who called himself Django and immediately demands a stack of money because Django of course killed their main fighter, Worm and Lictor. Luke then immediately professes that he has nothing to do with Django and has absolutely no idea who he is, but the Kanji aren't having it, threatening to kidnap the whole group. Luke is not going to stand for this, so he ignites his yellow lightsaber in an instant, telling the Kanji that they'll be leaving now. The Kanji however doubt that this young boy is a real Jedi, saying, Lightsaber, huh? Haven't seen one of those in a long time. But just because you've got a lightsaber, doesn't make you a Jedi, boy. Luke fires back at this, telling them that he agrees fully, and it's actually something else entirely that makes him a Jedi. At this point, the Kanji are done talking, and immediately open fire on the group, leading Luke to cleanly weave his yellow blade to every blaster bolt, and deflect them back with menacing power. After realizing that Luke Skywalker is actually a Jedi, their minds immediately go back to a bounty placed on him by Palpatine, switching their plans to kill the two Wookiees, and only stun the Jedi so that they can collect the bounty. After hearing this, 
Luke wants to immediately retreat for the safety of the group, but Chewie is very reluctant because this is the only lead he has to finding Han. Skywalker fully understands his friend's situation, but eases his mind by telling him that they can't even be certain that Jango is Boba and they'll find another way. Chewie then roars in pain and rushes out into the open, firing on the kanji with pure rage and anger. After releasing his anger on the kanji criminals, the crew escape through a back hatch in the structure, but are met by even more trouble on the other side. Luke is going to have to pull off something huge to escape this one. On his mark, Luke force pushes a speeder into the most dangerous kanji, while the two Wookiees commandeer the vehicle and prepare their escape. Luke then hops onto the top of the speeder to protect the others with his bright yellow lightsaber, allowing them to escape just in the nick of time. Unfortunately, their encounter with these savage criminals isn't over just yet. Luke is forced to remain on the hood of the speeder as they travel through the narrow streets of Narshada, with snipers posted on the rooftops of every corner. Luke then immediately comes over to R2, wanting him to get the Falcon ready because he's going to be coming in hot very shortly. Moments later, the Wookiees dive into the Falcon and rush into the cockpit, immediately taking off to safety and away from the deadly streets of Narshada. The Kanji criminals are disgusted that they managed to let the crew go, but one of them suggests that they should report the presence of this crew to the Imperial Garrison on the planet Vandor, which is of course another reference to Solo A Star Wars Story, and was the planet where Han helped Beckett out with the train heist for the Coaxium. Either way, his criminal friend brushes this off and says, What do you think? That guy was a Jedi. Back on the Falcon, 3PO apologizes for disturbing Luke so soon after the battle, and Luke asks where they will drop Sagwa off after his incredible help. 3PO then responds by telling his master that Sagwa actually intends to join the Rebel Alliance, and after recent events, he wants to move on from his contacts on Narshada and never look back. Being very pleased to hear that, Luke is again interrupted, this time by Artu, who says he has a deeply important message to share with him. Luke knows that whenever R2 has a message, he usually ends up being important. R2 then reveals that while on board the Death Star, he managed to hack into the computer systems and uncover a list of former Jedi outposts across the galaxy, which excites Luke as he'll finally be able to study more of the Jedi's history and learn about their practices and traditions. Luke even makes fun of how convenient it is that R2 has just what he needs, just when he needs it. Either way, R2 lists off all of the Jedi outposts he found on the Death Star, before Sagwa calls Luke over to join him and Chewie in the cockpit, because he has received a transmission from General Organa, who needs the Falcon to return to the main Rebel fleet immediately for a very mysterious and cryptic reason. It seems that the Rebel Alliance has received a coded message from an unknown party, claiming to be in possession of Han Solo, inviting them to a large display. We of course know that this message is from Kira and Crimson Dawn, who are eager to make their return to the galaxy and put their name back on the map with a massive target like Han Solo. After the death of Maul to Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine, Kira has some pretty big shoes to fill, and this is certainly one way to do it. So I can't wait to see how the story continues in the rest of the War of the Bounty Hunter comics. So that is episode 1.1 of the War of the Bounty Hunter story, which will be tying into the Book of Boba Fett and the hunt for Han Solo, who is still frozen in carbonite. Thanks so much for watching, really hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers guys, hope to see you in the next one.